Now, expected value is an extremely useful concept for good decision making. So let's start here. Let's go back to the lottery example, which we started to talk about last week. The lottery has also been called a, a tax on people who are bad at math, and I tend to agree with that viewpoint. I'm not saying that lotteries are bad uh, because uh, most lotteries also go, some of the revenue goes to pay for things like schools and parks, uh, but um, I'm usually not willing to pay that tax myself because if you do out the math, the lottery is not really uh, a great deal. Uh, you know, there's, there's good reasons not to play. Now remember, we saw the lottery last week. A particular lottery works by picking six numbers from 1 to 49. You get to punch off six numbers from 1 to 49. We last week just talked about the probability of winning, but let's put some dollar figures to that today. So if it costs a dollar to play the lottery, and let's say on a particular week the winnings after taxes are $2 million. If you play the lottery once, what are your expected either winnings or loses? In other words, what's your expected value here? Well, we can calculate an expected value to answer the question of whether or not it's a good idea to play the lottery. So again, we calculated the probability of winning last week. So what's the probability of winning the lottery? Well, this particular lottery, there's 49 numbers. So there are 49 choose six possible combinations that turns out to be about 14 million. So your chances if you play one ticket of winning the lottery are one in 14 million. We saw that that's the combination function we, we saw last week. Well, now we can think about this in a probability as a probability distribution. There's like two possible outcomes here. You either win or you lose. So let's write out the probability function. So your two possible outcomes in dollar values are you either lose a dollar, so negative one, or you win $2 million, so positive $2 million. The probabilities associated with each of those dollar outcomes is the probability of losing a dollar is 0.999999928. The probability of winning $2 million is 7.2 times 10 to the negative 8. We can use that probability function to calculate an expected value here. So let's do that. So how would we calculate expected value? We're going to take each x and multiply it by its probability and then add those up. So that's easy to do here. Take the negative 1, multiply it times this very, very uh, close to 1 probability, 0.999928. Uh, take the uh, $2 million and multiply it by the chance of winning, the 7.2 times 10 to the negative 8. When you do that and add that all up, it turns out to be that your expected value is negative 86 cents. In other words, you're expected to lose money. So in general, if your negative value is expected, it's not a good idea uh, to play. Uh, if you expect to lose money, it's not a really good investment for you. And uh, you might think, well, 86 cents, or, you know, it doesn't sound so bad, but of course we can project this over the long run. On average, for every time you play, you expect to lose 86 cents. So if you play every week for 10 years, uh, 520 times, uh, you're expecting to lose even more than that. You're expecting to lose, you know, $447. And you get the idea. On average, you're expecting to lose, and that increments. The more you play, the more that adds up, the more that you lose. Now, of course, some people have argued to me that the lottery has some immeasurable values that we're not factoring in here, right? So for uh, for some people, the excitement of playing the lottery might be worth that value, that dollar a week to them. Uh, it's certainly less than we spend on, a lot of people spend on coffees and things. So, so maybe there's some intrinsic psychological benefit that people get out of the lottery. Um, I probably wouldn't get that benefit since I'm positive that I'm going to lose. So... Now let's get back to the Mega Millions jackpot uh, that I mentioned in the teaser. So in 2012, the Mega Millions lottery had gotten up to a record jackpot, the biggest ever, of $656 million. So this means that there had probably been a number of weeks that had gone by in this particular lottery where nobody had won, and so the pot had built up. And your choice when you have a, uh, you know, when you win the lottery is to take the, or the that amount and and get it distributed to you over say 30 years or you can get an immediate payout and you pay you at, you know you get a lot less but you get it right away and so that the immediate payout here was going to be around 474 million so somebody had emailed me and said uh, the following if the odds of winning the mega millions is 1 in 175 million and we're going to assume that, that those odds are correct because it's right from the mega millions uh, website and notice that this lottery has a lot worse odds uh, than the one we just calculated. That's because there's more possible numbers involved in this one. But if the odds is 1 in 175 million, 
is there a significant statistical advantage in playing a hundred tickets rather than one? For a half billion with a B dollars, it almost seems worth it, this person said. So they wanted to know, well, when the jackpot gets so huge, does it make it suddenly worth it to play and maybe even to play a larger number of tickets so that you increase your chances of winning? So let's look at this as an expected value problem. So we can calculate the expected value. Let's start with the expected value for one ticket. So what's your chance of winning? It's 1 in 175 million. What's your chance of losing? It's 1 minus 1 in 175 million or 99.999994%. So we can do out the probability distribution here. So in this case, it still costs a dollar to lose, but now the jackpot is 500 million. Our probability of winning is 6, point, uh, 6 times 10 to the negative ninth. I just converted the 99.99994 to uh, make it easier to write out. Oh, sorry, 1 minus the, the, if you do 1 minus the 0.99994, you get the 6 times 10 to the negative ninth. So let's calculate the expected value. So x times the probability of x, add those up. We get, interestingly enough, because the jackpot is so humongous here, you get a positive expected value, which is a very unusual thing in a lottery. So you get a positive expected value of $2. That's very interesting because usually for lottery problems, the expected value comes out negative. So let's continue on with the question that the person who emailed me had asked. What about if we do this for 100 tickets? Are we going to have increase our expected value, increase our chances of winning? We certainly are going to increase our chances of winning somewhat by 100, buying 100 tickets. What will that do to our expected value? So first of all, let's calculate the chances that you will lose if you buy 100 tickets. So what's your chance of losing if you buy one ticket? Your chance of losing is 1 minus 1 over 175 million. Your chance of winning is 1 over 175 million, therefore your chance of losing is 1 minus that. That's your chance of losing with one ticket. Now, if you buy 100 tickets, the chance of losing is that you have to, that has to occur, your loss has to occur 100 times. 100 tickets have to not work, work out. So you have to raise this to 100. So 1 minus 1 over 175 million raised to 100. Uh, that's how you calculate the probability of losing with 100 tickets, and that turns out to be, it's still a really, really high probability of losing, it turns out to be 99.999943%, so a really, really high chance still that you will lose, even with 100 tickets, not surprisingly. Let's calculate the expected value now. So here's the probability distribution. You're either going to lose a dollar or win 500 million. And here's the probability. So the probability of winning is 0.999993. So your probability of losing is, uh, I'm sorry, your probability of losing is 0.999993. So your probability of winning is 1 minus that, which is 5.7 times 10 to the negative 7. So if I subtract 0.999993 from 1, you get 5.7 times 10 to the negative 7. So very small chance still of winning. Let's calculate out the expected value then. So let's do the expected value. So if I calculate the expected value here, interestingly, it comes out to be an expected value of 284. Well, that's pretty good because it's a positive and, you know, it's a decent amount of money. So one could make the case just looking at that for maybe for playing. Now, you're still virtually guaranteed to lose, right? Your chance of losing is still really, really high. But based just on those things, one could make a case for playing. And you can actually work out that the expected payout only has to be greater than 176 million for this particular lottery for the expected value to be positive. So as long as the, the, the lottery jackpot is greater than 176 million, based on the little calculation we've done so far, the expected value is going to be positive. Of course, there's a but in this. So we got to go a little further because there's more to it than this. What we haven't considered yet is that the chance that there could be multiple winners. Now, usually in any given week, the chance of multiple winners is pretty small because the chance you know, you, of one person winning is small, the chance of two people getting the same number is small, but it does happen sometimes. But think about what happens when the jackpot is huge. It gets, it was, you know, hugely covered in the media. So all of a sudden everybody hears about it and lots of people play. So when you have lots and lots and lots of people playing the lottery, 
even though there's 175 million different combinations that are possible, when more than 175 pe million people play that lottery, actually you start to get into having a high probability of multiple winners, and multiple winners have to share, have to split the jackpot. So it turns out, I went back and tried to figure out for that particular Mega Millions lottery when the jackpot had gotten up to 656 million, I wanted to try to figure out how many people actually played, how many tickets were sold. I didn't find that easily on Google, uh, but I found some data on the Mega Millions website which showed how many people won all of the different possible prizes. So there's the jackpot and then there's a whole bunch of smaller prizes people could win. And I'm able to estimate, uh, to make a pretty good ballpark estimate that based on those, the, the number of people who won those things, that there were probably about 600 million tickets sold, somewhere in that ballpark, it's a rough estimate. But 600 million tickets sold, there were only 175 million different only. <laughs> 175 million different combinations. So suddenly you're realizing that a lot of combinations got played, had to have been played multiple times. And that means there's actually a high, high chance of multiple winners here. So uh, what I've done out here is I figured out the probability distribution for the number of winners. So X here is the number of winners for this record jackpot uh, mega millions. Assuming that 600 million tickets were sold, here's how many winners we expect. So uh, the way that I calculated out these probabilities is actually I treated this as a, a binomial distribution. And we're going to be talking about the binomial distribution in just two modules. So tuck that in the back of your head that the way that I was able to figure this out was a binomial distribution. It turns out that the probability of, it, of having no winners when you have 600 million tickets played is only 3%. The probability of having only a single winner is 11%. The probability of having two winners is 19%. The probability of having three winners is 22%. And you can see all the probabilities. And I only went out to 10. By the time you got to the probability of having 10 winners at once, that was a pretty small probability. And the probability of 11 or more, those probabilities were essentially negligible because they were so small. So I didn't bother to keep going. Well, we can calculate the expected value of the number of winners here using this probability distribution. So I take each value x and multiply it by its probability, add those up, you come out with that the expected number of winners, if 600 million people play or 600 million tickets are played, uh, is 3.4. And so you're actually expecting multiple winners. And in fact, it turns out that in this Mega Millions, particular Mega Millions uh, week, in the lottery, there were actually three winners. So the expected value bore out just perfectly. So the expected winnings isn't really 500 million here because we were expecting to split the pot by uh, with 3.4 people. There were 3.4 people are expected to split the pot. So if you divide the 500 million by 3.4, it's roughly somewhere around 150 million that you're actually expecting to win. Well, that 147 million uh, puts us below the figure of 176 million that's needed to have a positive expected value. So when you factor in the chance of multiple winners, it turns out that now we're back into that negative territory for expected value. And I haven't factored in taxes either. I think about half of the lottery winnings get uh, siphoned off by the federal government and state government for taxes. So that would put our total down to a jackpot of only $75 million, which will clearly keep us in the negative range for expected value. So uh, just based on expected value, then it wouldn't be worth playing. And regardless of expected value, the fact is, you're still almost guaranteed to lose with near certainty because the probability of losing is so, so, so high. So that's just a fun little problem. Now, another great uh, example of expected value is to talk about gambling. And I think gambling is just like the greatest business model because it's completely set up to guarantee that the casino will make money. And so um, it's just a great guaranteed way to make money. And we can show that. So, so how does gambling work? Let me just give you a particular thing you might encounter in a casino, a roulette wheel. Most people are familiar with the roulette wheel. So the roulette wheel has the numbers from 1 to 36 as well as O and OO. And you get to bet on one of those. Uh, you get to bet on, let's say, you can bet that an odd number will come up. Um, and if you bet, let's say you bet a dollar, then an odd number will come up. 
you will win a dollar if the odd number comes up, you will lose a dollar if the odd number doesn't come up. Now, uh, because zero and zero, zero are counted as even numbers, you have, there are 18 odd numbers, but there are 20 even numbers. So you have an 18 out of 38 chance of winning a dollar, you have a 20 out of 38 chance of losing a dollar. So unlike the lottery now, the chances of winning and losing are purposely stacked up to be pretty close to one another. But if that's the probability distribution, what's the expected value going to be here? Well, we can calculate that. So the expected value is you win a dollar with probability 18 out of 30, you lose a dollar with 20 out of 38 probability. So your expected value is negative 5 cents. Now what's neat about the gambling is that they've set the probabilities close enough that sometimes you're definitely going to win. If you play a couple enough times, you're definitely going to win sometimes. So that, of course, is what hooks people in. You have to win enough to hook you in. You have to let people win enough so they get hooked in. But on average, if you play over a long time, for every game you play, you lose about a nickel. So on average, the casino is guaranteed over the long run to win money. And of course, if the stakes are higher, the dollar amounts get higher. So if it was a $10 game, then the expected value is negative 53 cents for the player, which means positive 53 cents for the casino. And let's imagine that um, the casino played 10,000 games in a night. It's a winning an average of 53 cents per game. That means it takes in $5,300 a night just from the roulette wheel. So you can see that this is a fantastic business model because the casino just based on expected value and statistics knows that over the long run it's going to keep breaking in money uh, and uh, of course that means the player over the long run is going to keep shedding money. Now returning to the challenge problem that I set out as one of the teasers for the week. So this problem was you're in a resource poor area and you want to screen the population for some disease. But the antibody test is fairly expensive and you don't have enough money to pay for antibody tests for everybody. So people have come up with a clever cost saving strategy, which is to pool the blood from multiple samples. So for every person who comes in and gets, uh, the ta gets their blood drawn, you set aside half of their blood. You take the other half of their blood and you pool it into a pooled lot of say N people. If the pooled lot is negative. So assuming that the antibody test is sensitive enough that it will pick up any virus if anybody has the virus. So if it comes back negative, that means that nobody has the virus. If you can get the pooled lot, if that's negative, you don't have to run any more tests on those people because you know that everybody that you included in the pool is negative. So that saves you N minus one tests. Of course, if that pool bot comes out to be positive, then you do have to go back to the original individual samples and test everybody to figure out who it is that has the disease. That will require you N plus one tests, so you, have to, you end up having to do an extra test. So if a particular disease has a prevalence of 10% in a population, is this a good case? Is that, is that rare enough that the pooling strategy will work? Of course, if the disease prevalence gets too high, then there's not going to be enough negative lots when you pool people. So will this pooling strategy work? And if so, what's the optimal number of samples to pool per lot? What's the N here? How many people should I put, did I pool together? You don't want to pool too many because then the chance of the, uh, the pool bot coming back negative will be too small, that you won't save many antibody tests. So there's a couple of ways you could solve this. You could, if you want, and this is a great thing for those of you who really want to be challenged in this course, you could solve this very elegantly by writing out an elegant general solution and solving for the optimum. I'm actually not going to solve it that way. I'm going to just solve it with brute force. I'm just going to try a bunch of things and we'll eventually arrive at the right answer. Actually, brute force is a really good way, even if you want to find out the elegant solution. Usually it's a good idea to start with the brute force solution and then the elegant solution will kind of materialize out of that. So you, at the end of this all, you might want to write down and figure out the elegant solution. Uh, and I'm also going to just assume uh, that we want to screen 100 people. And I'm just picking 100 because it's a nice, even number. Remember, sometimes if you pick 100, it just makes things easy to deal with whole numbers. So I'm just going to assume we want to screen 100 people. Uh, it doesn't matter how many we're screening. Um, it will, this will generalize. So let's just try something. We'll say, well, what if we wanted to pool 20 people, um, it, 20 people's blood? Will that save us antibody tests? So let's start there. So how would we solve this one? So again, the prevalence of the disease is 10%. And we want to pool um, 
we're going to try and see what would happen if we pooled 20 samples at a time. That means we, since we're starting with 100 people, 100 samples, that means we'll have five lots. How, how many tests are we expected to have to run? And again, we're assuming that the test is perfect, the sensitivity and specificity is perfect here. So we can calculate, this is an expected value problem. We can calculate the expected number of tests here. So we'll kind of call x is equal to the number of tests that we're going to have to run. And actually, in this case, x can only take on two possible values. You're either going to run one test, that's when the, it comes out negative, or you're going to have to run 21 tests. So if you have a pooled lot of 20 and that one comes out positive, you have to go back and run all the tests on all 20 of those samples, plus the initial test is one. So you're either ending up running one test if the pooled lot comes out negative, or 21 tests if the pooled lot comes out positive. Then we need to figure out, so we'll call that, it might be nice to put this in a nice little probability chart. So here's our two possible outcomes, one test or 21 tests. And then we need to figure out the probability of each of those outcomes. So what's the probability that that pooled lot is going to come back negative? Okay. So you have to think again, the prevalence of the disease here is 10%. What that means is that uh, any given person, a random person, has a 10% chance of having the disease. That means they have a 90% chance of not having the disease. In order for the pooled lot to come back negative in this case, we have to have 20 people in a row who come back negative. So every person has a 0.9 chance of being negative. We have to have 20 of those in a row. So it's 0.9 raised to the 20th. That's the probability that the pooled lot will come out to be negative. If you calculate that out, that's a probability of 12.2%. So not super high that we're going to get a negative. And the negative, of course, is what we want here. What's the probability that the pooled lot is going to come out positive? Well, that's just going to be 1 minus the chance of it coming out negative. So 1 minus 0.9 to the 20th and that comes out to be 87.8%. So that's our probability distribution, and then we can calculate the expected value. So the expected value here is going to be 12.2% times 1 plus 87.8% times 21. Each x multiplied by its probability, add those up. It turns out that the expected value is 18.56. Again, I'm, I'm going to well, I'm going to say what would happen for 100 samples just so we can compare across different pooling strategies and have make it easy to compare. So if we want to do uh, 100 samples total and it's 18.56 per lot and we have five lots, we have to multiply by five here. So that tells us that per lot, per 20 people, we have to run 18.56 tests on average. That means per 100 people, we have to run 92.8 tests on average. Now, if we hadn't done any pooling strategy, we would have had to run 100 tests. So we are saving ourselves, on average, about seven antibody tests. It's not a great savings here. So, but we can, the pooling strategy does do something here. So we answered the first question. We know the pooling strategy is going to be effective here. But is 20 the optimal number? Well, it seems like we could do better. So let's try just, you know, again, I'm doing this brute force. So let's try what would the probability be if I wanted to pool, say, 10 at a time. So pooling 20, that's the answer, as I wrote on the last screen. But what about pooling 10? What if you pool only 10 samples at a time? How would that change things? Well, it's basically the same problem and the same logic. So now the expected value is going to be, there's going to be, you're either running one test now or you're running 11 tests. You have a 0.9 raised to the 10 chance of the lot coming out negative. So you have that much chance of running one test. One minus that is your chance of having to run 11 tests. And if you add that up, you end up with that there's 7.5 tests expected uh, on average per lot. And of course, uh, if we're pooling 10, that's, that's 7.5 tests per lot. But remember, we have 100 people total here, so there's going to be 10 lots total. So we have to multiply that by... Uh, 10, the 10 lots. So we'd end up running 75 antibody tests for those 100 people. Compare that to what we just calculated for 20. For pooling 20, it was 93. We've got it down to 75. So we're pooling fewer people is helping us out. Well, let's keep going. What about if we pooled five? Pool five people at a time. Same logic. Now you get the pattern. So it's going to be 0.9 raised to the fifth times one. Uh, 
plus 1 minus 0.9 raised to the fifth. That's a chance of getting a positive now times 6, because if you get a positive, you're going to have to run 5 plus 1 tests. Now we're going to end up running about 3.05 tests per lot, but we've had to do 20 lots because we've got 100 people total. So we end up with running only 61 tests. So we're still gaining as we're going down here. Well, let's go down. Now we're getting really close to, to uh, pooling you know, down to 1. We're, so let's go down increment by 1 here. What if we pooled 4 together? So actually, it turns out that the, the optimum is at 4. So when you calculate for 4, it turns out that you would end up using uh, 59 antibody tests. You'd expect to use 59 antibody tests. Now remember, this is otherwise you'd have to use 100 if you didn't pool at all. So this is saving you almost half of the antibody tests. This is for the, uh, when you have a disease prevalence of 10%. So pooling four is the optimum. You can keep going and show that pooling three actually gets you back up to 60 tests. So the optimum is hit at four. Now again, there's a more elegant way to solve this. You could write out a general equation and solve it and you could find that the value is four, but you can also use this kind of brute force method and that works as well. So you can see there's really a lot of practical applications in medicine of understanding a little bit of basic probability. I just want to briefly show you for the concept of expected value how it extends to the continuous case. So here is the expected value for the discrete case. We're adding up all the values of x times their probabilities. And as I mentioned, this generalizes to the continuous case because the summation becomes an integral. We're adding up over infinite number of possible values. So it just becomes an integral. I'm not going to worry about in this class having you do these integrals or anything, but I'll just show you a very simple example. What's the expected value of the uniform distribution? Well, again, if you just think about the expected value of the mean as a balancing point, another way to ask that is where's the balancing point of that distribution? Where could you put the fulcrum to balance that? And I think everybody would agree that you would just put the fulcrum at 0.5. So you don't need to do any calculus to get this one right. That's the balancing point. Now, if you wanted to do the calculus, it's actually not terribly hard for the uniform distribution. So I'll just show it here. Remember, the uniform distribution, the probability everywhere is just 1. So we would be just taking x times 1 and integrating from 0 to 1. That's the, the total range of possible values here. When you do out that integral, it does come out to be 1 half, so exactly what you would have predicted just based on intuition.